This photo uh, is of someone that I went to university with here at UQ. Uh, her name is Helen Demidenko. Uh, and she became famous for writing this novel, The Hand That Signed the Paper, uh, which went on to win Australia's number one literary award. And Helen said that the novel uh, was based on conversations she'd had uh, with her Ukrainian relatives about their experiences in World War II. And Helen made quite a big deal about her Ukrainian heritage. She'd go to multicultural festivals and traditional dress and do Ukrainian dances and sing Ukrainian songs, etc. Uh, and what was extraordinary about this story was that a couple of years after the book got released, it became apparent that Helen Demidenko was, in fact, Helen Darvel. She wasn't Ukrainian at all. And in fact, she just completely fabricated her entire ethnic heritage. Uh, and when that news broke, uh, she became the latest in a long and scandalous list of imposters, people who have faked who they are uh, in order to get some kind of advantage. And history uh, is full of these people, uh, women who have tried to pass as men, uh, paupers who have tried to pass as members of the royal family, um, and also people who have tried to fake their race. And it could be that you're all old enough now to be able to reflect on a time in your life where maybe you've just stretched the truth a little bit about your past, or you've allowed someone uh, to think that you're someone that you're not. And if that has happened to you, you might want to just think about that moment for a while. Well, I'll make three very quick points about imposters. Uh, the first thing that I want to mention was that a lot of imposters seem to be able to get away with their lie uh, for an extraordinary period of time despite what seems at times to be smoking gun evidence uh, that there's something wrong. So Helen Darvel was 21 before she started faking her Ukrainian heritage. Um, among people who knew of her, including myself, it was the cause of quite a bit of puzzlement and discussion that this person suddenly had a different name and suddenly had this never-before-detected Ukrainian heritage. And there must have been literally hundreds of people who suspected her secret or personally knew her very British parents. And yet it took two years before that lie got exposed. This is what I call imposter blindness. Um, an extraordinary example of imposter blindness relates to the strange case of Billy Tipton. Billy Tipton uh, was a very talented and successful jazz musician for many decades. And it was only after he died that people found out that he was in fact a she. And this is despite the fact, mind you, that uh, she had four wives, Okay, none of whom suspected that they were in fact married to a woman. And Billy went through extraordinary lengths to protect her secret. She said that she had this terrible accident uh, when she was younger and that helped explain uh, the need for the bandages around her chest all the time and it helped explain the need for a prosthetic penis. But all the same, you think, this is an incredibly exposable secret. How could you get away with this? A lie of that magnitude for your entire life. Probably my favourite example of imposter blindness relates to this woman, Hannah Snell. Hannah was a sailor and a soldier in the British Navy in the 19th century. Uh, and for most of that time, for about four or five years, she masqueraded as a man, James Gray. And there was this dramatic anecdote where at one point she'd been caught uh, drinking and rabble rousing with mates on this naval ship. And as punishment, she got sentenced to the lash. And of course, the lash is delivered to a, a bare back. And afterwards, the captain of the ship wrote in his log uh, about the strange breast-like shapes on this man's chest, and, and yet still the pain didn't drop, right? So presumably it just lays so far outside the realm of this guy's imagination that a soldier in the British Navy could possibly be a woman that he couldn't trust what he was seeing with his own eyes. In some ways, I think imposter blindness uh, speaks to a rather charming aspect of modern society that we despite our self-image just being really quite cynical and sceptical, people are incredibly trusting that other people are who they say they are. Um, as one author wrote, it doesn't occur to us to ask whether that masked figure poised over our naked unconscious body with a knife is in fact a doctor, just as it probably hasn't occurred to you to question that I am in fact uh, an academic at the University of Queensland. We tend to trust these things implicitly. I've spoken about imposter blindness. I now want to talk about the motives for imposterism. Um, not all imposters are motivated for fame or fortune, like Helen Demidenko. Some imposters are escapologists. They're running away from uh, a flawed past, or they're trying to rehabilitate their image in the context of a great shame. Some imposters are just rampant adventurers. 
Uh, they're really just getting off from the thrill of living in a world where there's literally no obstacles to being whoever you want to be. And some imposters, I think, are attracted to the idea of being part of a, a close-knit community that offers solidarity and offers support, uh, and perhaps gives you a touch of sympathy from the outside world. So that might help explain the vast number of people uh, who lay false claims to being Vietnam War veterans, for example, or World War II War veterans. But some imposters are running away from persecution. Uh, and sometimes that really requires very dramatic and inventive forms of imposterism. There are examples, for example, of Jewish people in World War II who would disguise um, or literally change their physiology uh, to be able to escape detection from the Nazis. But quite often in life, if you want to run away from persecution, you don't have to do anything quite as traumatic as that. Right? If you're gay, for example, to not reveal your sexuality is frequently enough to pass as being straight. So the gay person who's closeted can find themselves living the life of an imposter not because of what they've said, um, not because of what they've done, uh, but because of what they haven't said and what they haven't done. Um, and this can have a peculiar uh, set of psychological consequences. There was a great study done by Deborah Frabel and others where she tracked all these undergraduate students uh, at Harvard University for a couple of weeks. And some of these students uh, had mild stigmas that are visible, okay? They're conspicuous, so maybe they're physically disabled or they're stutterers or they're very obese or they're members of racial minorities like African Americans. And others had mild stigmas uh, that were concealable, they're invisible. So people with eating disorders, people who are gay, people who came from very poor backgrounds. Now you might expect that people who have concealable stigmas, who can pass uh, quite easily to the mainstream, should fare better in this new context. But in fact, the reverse was true. Uh, it was the people who had the invisible stigmas, who had the opportunity of living a double life, who did significantly worse in terms of well-being, in terms of self-esteem, etc. And this dovetails with a whole lot of research that suggests that to live the double life is uh, a long and lonely and difficult path. Now, to be forced to be uh, out and proud about your situation presents its own challenges, but what it does give you is the opportunity to live an integrated life, and it also gives other people who are like you the opportunity to find you. Okay? And those people who are like you become this incredibly important source of self-esteem and social support and well-being. Another point I want to make is that even when imposters are rogues, okay, even when they're scoundrels or criminals, um, society often holds a degree of admiration for them. There's this fond fascination for the imposter. There's dozens of films uh, that have been built around real-life imposter stories. And in many of these films, the imposter is portrayed as a hero or as a semi-hero. Um, and in some ways, that's not entirely surprising. We live in a world where often there are obstacles to social mobility. And then you see these people who take these crazy risks to catapult themselves uh, into the social world that they'd otherwise be denied. Okay? And that's a romantic, kind of attractive notion. Uh, imposters can also be attractive in the way that they highlight the, the vanities uh, and the pretensions and the prejudices of the society in which we live. We do live in a world which is overly impressed by superficial characteristics like your title or your uniform. Right? And sometimes it's really quite thrilling to see someone take rampant advantage of that. My favorite example of this is the so-called um, Captain of Korpenick. Uh, the Captain of Korpenick was in fact this man, Wilhelm Voigt. He was a very poor cobbler uh, in Berlin. Uh, and he was a petty thief and he spent half his life in jail. But his life turned around when he found in a second-hand store the discarded uniform of a captain in the Prussian Guards. Uh, and, of course, he discovered that once he wore this uniform, uh, people in the street would snap to attention, and that would automatically offer him the kind of respect that typically he was denied. And emboldened by this, he hatched what probably remains, I think, one of the ballsiest criminal conspiracies of all time, where he put on his uniform, and he went to a local army barracks, and he barked orders that these soldiers in the barracks, and formed a little squad of about a dozen soldiers who he led to believe were going to go on this very important mission. 
And he marched the soldiers down to the local railway station and they traveled all the way to Kopenick, which is a town just outside Berlin. And once they were there, they dramatically confronted the mayor of the town and the treasurer and arrested them on completely fabricated charges of embezzlement. Uh, and these two people who were presumably completely bewildered were then taken on the train back to Berlin to face interrogation. Uh, and Wilhelm Voigt uh, was able to go home, uh, presumably laughing his head off. What he'd done is he'd actually uh, confiscated 4,000 marks as part of the trial, as evidence in the trial, and then he was able to enjoy his newfound wealth. Now, unfortunately, uh, Wilhelm was arrested and he was thrown in jail. But uh, he was released quite early and uh, he ended up becoming a German folk hero uh, quite deservingly, I think. But I don't want to give the impression that imposters are always seen to be romantic or attractive. Um, research by Yolanda Yetten and myself here at UQ suggests that if you're a member of the group that somebody's making a false claim to belong to, then you typically don't find these kinds of acts particularly romantic or attractive or funny. And the more you care about your group, uh, the less likely you are to find the positive side of imposterism. And the reason that genuine members of a group are highly threatened by imposters is really rooted very deeply in the psychology of group membership. People want their groups to be tight and cohesive and well-defined and to have clear boundaries. These are, these are the good things for us. And imposters trample all over that. Okay, they make a mockery over the criterion for acceptance and they completely dilute the boundaries of the group and dilute what it means to be a member of that group. And so if you're a genuine member of a group, an imposter is like an irritant or a contaminant that's entered the skin of the group and you're desperate to get rid of it. And sometimes that desperation can reach a fever pitch um, and it can border on being something like a witch hunt as people have these debates about who's a real group member and who's a fake, right? So can you, saw, can you call yourself a Christian if you don't go to church a hell of a lot? Can you call yourself a vegetarian if occasionally you eat seafood? Well, some people would say yes and some people would say no. Of course, there's no objective answers to these questions. Okay, but there is a debate and that debate is wrapped in emotion and politics and ideology. And it becomes this tense struggle to work out what the non-negotiable norms of the group are. And sometimes the accusation of imposterism really becomes a way of slapping people into line when you feel as though they're straying from the pack. We have a whole bunch of terms in the English language. To describe people who have what you see to be a superficial claim to a particular identity, but deep down you suspect they're not the real deal. And most of these terms are incredibly highly charged and derogatory. So here, we're talking about imposterism as an accusation, imposterism as a political weapon, uh, imposterism as an instrument of control, or even as a form of bullying. So we've spoken about extraordinary people who have acted as imposters. We've spoken about imposterism as an accusation. I just want to spend a few minutes at the end talking about uh, imposterism as an anxiety. Uh, these two psychologists back in the 1970s detected what they uh, termed the imposter phenomenon. And they found out that there was a hell of a lot of people in the workplace who wrestle with this anxiety that their public reputations far exceeded uh, what they believed their true talents to be. Okay? And these psychologists originally thought this is something quite specific to the psychology of that first generation of women who went into professional life in the 60s and 70s. But we now know that it's equally true of men, and it's completely rife in universities, both amongst students and staff. Now, many of these people who suffer from the imposter syndrome are very successful people, but they can't internalize their success. Okay, they attribute their success to things other than their talents, to contacts, to perseverance, to timing, to luck. And it's a very stressful experience. These people live lives that are constantly on the brink of a great shame. They feel as though any day now they're going to get tapped on the shoulder by someone or someone's going to pull back the curtain, Wizard of Oz style, and expose them as the flawed little human being that they know themselves to be. And it's very difficult to overcome. You can't overcome this anxiety by just doing good work. Because remember, your anxiety is that the world thinks that you're better than you know yourself to be. Okay, so every time you get an award or a promotion or a pat on the back or praise, it's just deepening that gulf between the messages you're getting from the world and what your self-image is. So it deepens the anxiety. I think 
in some ways, this can help explain why sometimes signs of self-doubt and anxiety actually go up after we're praised. And sometimes they go up even more so than after we're criticized. Because we spend a hell of a lot of time trying to impress other people. But when we do impress them, then we worry that maybe essentially what we've done is just tricked people into thinking we're something we're not. And in some ways, I think this reinforces one of the ironies of imposterism. We're not, we're not all the kind of people who are going to make dramatic leaps and fake our sex or fake our religion or fake our race. But all of us strive to put a positive face to the world. And all of us strive to disguise our flaws in the eyes of other people. We get very good at this. And as you get older and you get more and more sophisticated at being able to do this, the idea of a true self or an authentic self becomes harder and harder to find. And maybe this is one of the reasons why we're so uh, intrigued by imposters. Not because we want to be like them, but because we worry that deep down we are like them. After her secret got exposed, Helen Darville uh, got a job with the Courier Mail uh, as a columnist. Uh, but it only lasted a couple of weeks. Her second column, as it turned out, was rampantly plagiarized from the internet. Uh, and so she was sacked. And at that point, she gave up writing. She then en enrolled in a law degree at UQ and graduated. And the last I heard, she was working as a judge's assistant. Um, she's now faded out of public life. So she, I guess she lives on really as a memory or as a representation of something, a symbol of something, which raises the question of what does she represent? What lessons are learned? And I think there's two ways to spin this. On the downside, you could say, here's someone who's a destroyer. Okay, this person bulldozed uh, through the collective faith of society uh, in order to uh, further her own ambitions. Uh, but I think there's another way of spinning this. On the upside, you could say, what Helen represents uh, is a reminder that the world is mysterious, uh, that the world is full of surfaces, uh, that many of these surfaces are illusions, and that fundamentally life is a performance with all the sense of drama and anarchy and possibility that this implies. Thank you very much.